Should you get the COVID-19 vaccine that just got approved? In this video, we're going to make an easy to understand clinical review of the actual Pfizer trial so that you can make your informed decision. Quick disclaimer, the purpose of this video is to objectively go through the trial. This is not for any medical advice. But the goal of this video is to explain that trial easily so that you're able to make your own informed decision. And also take note of when this video was released. It was released December 16th. And if there's any updates, it will be in the link down below. So to actually understand this clinical trial, we're going to need to talk about the different phases of clinical trials that every drug goes through. And these phases allow us to see how the drug works, how much of the drug to give, how often to give the drug, and whether the drug is both safe and, most importantly, effective. So before the phases begin, there's always preclinical trials. So these are the laboratory studies. Essentially, this is to see if the new agent or new drug will be safe in animals. Unfortunately, it is sad. We do test on animals, but it has to pass the animal test before we even test in humans. So then we officially move into phase one clinical trials. The word clinical means human trials. So in phase one, it's very limited amount of people, usually tens of people. And this is just to study if the drug is safe in humans. So then we move into phase two. This is where we have more people joining the trial. And here we're going to study the safety again and the effectiveness now of the medication. And we move from tens of people to maybe up to a hundred people. And then we go into phase three trials, which has even more people. So now we go to a few hundred to a couple thousand. And here again, we study the safety, effectiveness, and now the dosing on people. And to give you an idea of how long these phases usually last, phase one, we could see a drug being in there for one to six months. And then if it moves to phase two, we could see it there for three to 18 months. And then phase three, anywhere from 12 to 30 months. And these numbers were pulled from the FDA website, and that's linked down below. So after phase three, the FDA has the ability to approve or deny the drug. And then technically the drug goes into something called phase four. And this isn't a traditional phase. This just means that we're going to monitor the drug long term throughout its use. And it's important to go over this because we can compare these average lengths of phases to our Pfizer trial. Now, primarily, we're going to focus in phase three. But to give you some extra information, the phase one and phase two trials had 195 participants for the Pfizer vaccine. And then in phase three, they ramped it up to 43,448 participants. So now we know the background of what's usually done so we can compare, right? So the first thing is time. So the average time for phase one to phase three completion was 28 months. And again, we got that from the FDA website, link down below, with Pfizer's vaccine approval time being eight months. And that's from April till December. So there's a 20 month difference on average from traditional drugs being approved to the Pfizer vaccine being pumped out quickly. So that may sound bad, but let's dig a little deeper. So we also have the number of participants in each phase, but we said we're going to focus on phase three. So the average number of participants in phase three is anywhere from 300 patients to 3000 patients. Pfizer's number of participants in phase three alone was 43,000. This is more than 10 times the average amount of a clinical trial. So what other factors could be involved in speeding up this clinical trial? Well, typically drug manufacturers are a private business, so they don't really get government funding. So the average government funding on a pharmaceutical is typically zero dollars. But this was a different case. The government offered a $1.95 billion purchase order for 100 million doses. So this is going to tell Pfizer to hire more scientists, speed up the process. So again, these are three points that you might want to factor in when making your decision for getting the vaccine. So now let's dive deeper in the clinical trial setup. Let's see how they actually set up this trial 
to get the results they did. So, few things to point out. Here we see that it's a randomized controlled trial. This is typically a good thing. Randomized controlled trial is known as the gold standard of research. That's because it limits bias, because everything's randomized. And we see it's a placebo-controlled clinical trial, meaning that one group is the placebo-controlled group, meaning they get injected with just water, while we have the treatment group, which we get injected with the vaccine. This study was also a multinational study. There were 130 sites in the U.S. alone, and there are also sites in Brazil, South Africa, Argentina, Germany. So this is pretty good because we get a sample population of different cultures and backgrounds and genetics, which is something we want in our patient group. Another unique thing is it was observer blinded, which again reduces bias. And this means the person that's injecting the patient doesn't know if they're injecting them with normal saline, which is just water, or the actual vaccine. The only person that knows is the computer system. So that way, the person injecting doesn't shift or move around patients to give a result that we want, meaning it's truly randomized. The study says it was a one-to-one -one trial, meaning half the group gets the vaccine and the other half gets the placebo or the fake water injection. Typically, we'd want like a two-to-one, meaning there are twice as many people getting the vaccine versus only one part of the people getting a water injection because we know that's not going to do anything. Another key feature in the trial is said that patients were only followed for two months after their injection. So we only have two months of data after they became immunized to see side effects. Now that we know how they set up the trial, let's take a look at the results. So to remind us, between July 27th and November 14th, we had a total of 43,548 participants, ages 16 years or older, that underwent the randomization between 152 sites worldwide. So there's a lot of data and a lot of patients that they're collecting the results from. The first bit of information we get is that there were eight cases of COVID at least seven days after the second dose of the injection, among the vaccine group. And remember, the trial was one-to-one. -one. So there were 20,000 patients in the vaccine group, 20,000 patients in the placebo group. So only eight patients caught COVID after being immunized in the vaccine group. So let's take a look at the placebo group. So here we see 162 patients caught COVID after their second dose of injection of the placebo injection. So because they were injected with just water, out of the 20,000 patients, 162 of those patients got COVID. So we need to compare eight patients that got COVID with the true vaccine, and then 162 patients with the fake or water injection. Another interesting piece of information they give us is that there were 10 cases of severe COVID. So patients that required hospitalization to the point where they needed to be intubated, so they had to be hooked up to a breathing machine. And out of the 10 cases, only one of those patients were in the vaccine group. The other nine patients that were severe were in the placebo group. Okay, so now we know that the results of this study are pretty favorable for having the vaccine instead of being injected with the placebo or the water, right? And that makes sense. But realistically, we also need to look at the side effect profile of the vaccine. So I took this sentence right out of the trial itself, and I think it's important to go through it. They're saying that the safety profile of the COVID vaccine was characterized by short-term, mild to moderate pain at the injection site, fatigue, and headaches. So three pretty common side effects. The incidence of serious adverse events was low and was similar in the vaccine group and the placebo group. So I went through the actual study and I tried pulling out the important side effects and I wanted to see what they are really comparing because that sentence is kind of generic. So this is what I found. 
So first, there were more vaccine recipients with side effects when we compare it to just the placebo recipients. So there was a 27% chance versus a 12% chance of getting those side effects that were pretty mild. So the pain in the injection site, the fatigue, the headache. So we could see that the real vaccine had 27% of a chance of causing one or three of those side effects compared to just regular old water injections. So those are just side effects. Side effects are more mild. But what about the adverse events? Anytime you say adverse event, it means a very severe side effect or situation that the medication has caused. So in the vaccine group, the study actually did go into detail and said there were four adverse events. Out of the 20,000 patients in the vaccine group, one patient had a shoulder injury, one patient had a right axillary lymphadenopathy, which is swelling in the right armpit, the lymph node. A patient had a proximal ventricular arrhythmia, which is an irregular heartbeat essentially, and a right leg paresthesia, which is like that numbing feeling in your leg where you feel pins and needles. Now something very interesting from the trial, it showed that two patients in the vaccine group died, but four patients in the placebo group died. So that's crazy because we saw that the injection of water technically had double the deaths of the vaccine injection. When you pull up the actual details of these unfortunate deaths, it showed that the two patients in the vaccine group actually died. One of them had a heart attack and the other one had severe buildup of plaque in their arteries called arthrosclerosis. While the four in the placebo group Two of the deaths were actually unknown. One patient had a hemorrhagic stroke and the other one had a heart attack. So the big thing here is none of these deaths from either group were associated from COVID and they had no correlation with the vaccine injection and they had no correlation with the placebo water injection. And also one more note, the game plan for this trial is that they're going to continue monitoring all their patients for two years total. So right now we only have two months of data after they were immunized. They're going to follow them for another 22 months. And the last thing we need to talk about is why this vaccine is unique. So typically vaccines fall under two categories that we use. We have our inactive vaccines, which are completely inactive organisms. They cannot replicate, but unfortunately they cause a less immune response. We want an immune response when we get vaccinated. These are safer in our HIV patients and our other immunocompromised patients. A big popular inactive vaccine is the flu shot in the arm, the intramuscular one. And then we also have our live attenuated vaccines. These have weakened forms of the virus or bacteria. They are not inactive. They're technically live. They can replicate, but they are severely weakened. We do get a better immune response, which is what we want. These are not going to be safe in our HIV and immunocompromised patients, unfortunately. We do use live vaccines. So think of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. So your MMR vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, there's even a nasal flu vaccine that's actually like a mist, but it's a live flu vaccine. But now we have the COVID vaccine, which does not fall under either category. The COVID vaccine is actually the new kid on the block. It's the new technology. It's considered an mRNA vaccine. So instead of using an inactive form of the virus or a weakened form of the virus, it just literally sends a piece of mRNA which codes for something called the spike protein. And the spike protein is actually what's on the surface of the COVID virus. So to make a long story short, it basically just makes a little tiny piece of the virus and your body realizes that, hey, that COVID piece, that spike protein shouldn't be in here. And then you get your immune response. Now, this is the first of its kind that's out in the market. Hey, thanks for watching. 
So hopefully now you know a little bit more about the trial and the different results and how they set up the trial and everything that I could present to you so that you can make your own informed decision. So thanks for watching. And I do want to say I did water this down a little bit. I could have gotten into more detail about the statistical tests and all these other crazy literature review things, but I wanted to appeal to a broader audience. So hopefully this video makes sense and it's enough information for the majority of you guys watching. Thank you again.